Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast exploring storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, theater, among other areas of the arts. I want to welcome to the show a man who needs no introduction. If you're a noir fan, that is Eddie Muller, who is a writer and is the host of Noir Alley on TCM. Eddie is the founder and president of the Film Noir Foundation. He is the author of several books, such as Dark City, The Lost World of Film Noir, Dark City Dames, The Wicked Women of Film Noir, The Art of Noir, The Posters and Graphics from the Classical Era of Film Noir. And today we are discussing his new book, Noir Bar, Cocktails Inspired by the World of Film Noir. Eddie, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Robert. There seems to be a theme running through my work. I, <laughs> yeah. I, can you spot it? <laughs> yeah, there, were, there was there was one word that stood out in my introduction, I think. Yes, definitely. <laughs> the, but thanks so much for, uh, again for, for coming on. I, I, I love the, the book. I went through it within a few hours, I think. I mean, it is it's it's as tasty as those drinks, I'm sure. And as someone well, who yeah. doesn't drink. <laughs> well, OK, there you just answered the question. You said you went through it in a few hours. I was going to say, I, I hope you didn't drink your way through the book in a few hours. That could be dangerous. No, I didn't. I haven't gone there yet. But as as someone who who doesn't drink too much, uh, I was still I still thoroughly enjoyed it. And all of the stories and the movies you picked and why you picked the different drinks with the different movies. Um, it's wonderful. I mean, I thought it was a. I think it's really, really good. Thank you. That, and that's a wonderful testimonial that you say that you're not much of a drinker, but you still got a lot out of the book. That was. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was a conscious thing on my part like I, I figured you know not everybody who likes film noir also likes cocktails so you better give those people uh, a reason to pick up the book as well so thank yes. thank you for saying that my pleasure no that worked really really well um I wanted to start by asking I know that uh, the publisher running press suggested you do this book but what what makes you say yes to a cocktail noir book <laughs> <laughs> the research <laughs> oh, yeah, um, that's true. Uh, well it you know the the whole thing sort of it, for me at least it developed out of covid because we were kind of stuck at home and and i had started it was just unusual because i had started doing these videos because when i was at, during covid tcm uh sent me a bunch of equipment so i could do my shows at home because you know we were in quarantine and be, once I'd set up all the equipment, I, I got tired of taking it up and setting it down or putting it, you know, and uh, and so I left it up and started making cocktail videos. Uh, and I started my own little YouTube channel. Right. I mean, yes. you're the expert on this. I should have come to you for tips. <laughs> uh, but I started making cocktails and then and then I just kind of wore out. To be quite honest about it, I was doing it to kind of tie each cocktail into that week's episode of Noir Alley, but it just kind of wore me out after a while. And then when my editors, uh, Cindy, running press, was asking how about another book project, because the revised and expanded edition of Dark City did very, very well. And uh, she said, how about a cocktail book? And I said, huh funny you should say that and uh she said can you put together a proposal really quickly and i said here i'll just give you the link to my youtube channel <laughs> and and those videos the ones that existed i don't i i can't remember how many i did maybe 12 i don't know uh those videos sort of served as the proposal for the book mm. and the idea was oh this is cool if we can just get this on paper uh, th this would be a great book. I guess cocktail books are something that still sells. They're books yes. that still sell. Yes. Although I'm sure cocktail videos, uh, you know, are great. but anyway, uh, th that's the story of how we, we came up with it. And it, it was great fun then figuring out what I wanted to include. Well, it, I, I'm, you know, as a big film noir fan, I'm not sure why it never occurred to me how often they are they are in bars. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I mean, I was like, you, I was like, oh my god, yes, because I, I went through the book to watch some of the films in the book that I hadn't seen, and I was like, oh my god, yeah, the 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 cocktail lounges and and alcohol is such a major part of noir. Um, and I was curious how 
I mean, I love how you matched the different movies with the different drinks and for a variety of reasons, whether it was named after the actor or it was something about the city or something that brought out the themes uh, that matched the drink that you felt would match the drink. How, how did you go about picking the movies out of all of the film noirs? Why, why these why settle on these 50? It's it's just like programming a film festival. I mean, it was the exact same principle. You try to keep everything in balance, which is a very good word to use if you're a mixologist, because that's kind of what you're after when you're making a cocktail is you want you want to add various ingredients, but you want the drink itself to taste totally integrated and in like its own thing. So so you when you drink it, you're kind of not tasting any of the ingredients too strongly. It, it, they're all in the mix properly and balanced. Um, and, and it's the same thing when you're doing a, a film program. You don't want too much of one thing. You don't want to go too heavy on the depressing movies. You want to throw a couple of light things in there to, to take the pressure off, you know. Right. And so sometimes I would choose a cocktail because, oh, here's a backstory I really want to tell about um, either the film or maybe a person that was in the film or one of the filmmakers. Or there's a movie in which the cocktail actually plays an important part in the plot, uh, like yeah. the Blue Gardenia, where the, the pearl diver is sort of the instigator for the whole plot is that Ann Baxter gets a little tipsy on these cocktails and Raymond Bird takes advantage of her and right. pays the price. <laughs> um, you know, so there were a lot of different reasons. And then when I started researching, it was fun to see how many performers had had cocktails named for them and and some of these had fallen into complete obscurity like I, I did not know there was a Joan Blondell cocktail I did not know there was a Lee Tracy cocktail or a Joan Bennett cocktail so th those became kind of obvious choices provided I liked the cocktail Right. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't really like it, then it was, mm, I don't know. You know right. We'll see. Maybe we'll save that one for a sequel. <laughs> right. Well, when I went through the book, I counted 27 that I'd seen. And I was a little surprised. I thought, man, almost half this book I haven't uh, of the movies I haven't seen. So it's been such a great treat to go through and, and catch as many as I could before talking to you today. And one I wanted to bring up which I really loved, Wicked Woman. I know this, <laughs> which is, I just absolutely loved it. And I was curious, is, that, is there a chance that's going to be restored? Uh, I don't know if, you, if maybe maybe it already has been, and I don't know, but. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't really need to be restored. Um, oh, I, I must have saw a bad print then. Okay. You probably did see a bad print. I've shown that movie numerous times at my film festivals and there is a good print of it oh, in existence okay. there is a good 35 millimeter print of it in existence but it's one of the more popular films i've shown over the i mean i've been doing this for over 20 years now and i would say that wicked woman it, it because it was so obscure and because it is such an unusual yeah film it has a it has a fairly high camp quotient i have to say <laughs> yes uh, but it is really enjoyable. Now, see, that was an example of a film that I chose because it was relatively obscure and because Beverly Michaels, the actress who plays the Wicked Woman, um, <laughs> the allegedly Wicked Woman, she's really not that bad. <laughs> no, she's not, actually. <laughs> it's the Wicked Men in the film yeah. more than the Wicked Woman. Um, you know, I had met her and I, I was so charmed by her that I wanted to make the drink in her honor. And uh, in some cases, I would say, so what's that going to be, you know? And my mother used to always have an expression where she would refer to particular women as a long, tall drink of water. Right. And uh, I thought that was a pretty good description of Beverly Michaels, except <laughs> there has to be alcohol involved. Right. Right. Uh, and because she was from the Bronx originally, I chose a Bronx cocktail. But a Bronx cocktail is normally served in a coupe glass as a, you know, up as a cocktail. But in her honor, I stuck it in a in a tall chimney glass with ice in it. Perfect. Uh, because it just felt much more in keeping with her spirit. <laughs>
I think that works well. And for for someone like you know, for someone like myself who perhaps is not much of a drinker, but is now getting interested in this co- uh, cocktail culture, where where would you suggest starting? <laughs> with a horse's neck, which has <laughs> which you can make without any alcohol, and which is that's interesting. What I had my eye on. Yeah, interestingly, um, you know, I, I did want to make sure I included one non-alcoholic drink in the film in the book and how how fabulous that it would come from my favorite movie which is in a lonely place Mm. with humphrey Mm. bogart and gloria graham and it actually figures you know by name in the movie when uh the the young woman who is unfortunately going to be the murder victim uh has bogart make her a horse's neck because it's a non-alcoholic drink and um and so that that's what i chose and it it it's interesting because you can't, of course, make it with any kind of alcohol. Uh, any any highball made with ginger ale is actually called a buck. That was when I was making drinks. That was how I learned it, right? A whiskey buck, a gin buck, a vodka buck, scotch buck, any of those things. is just the booze with ginger ale is the mix. Mm. Uh, but a horse's neck has no booze, but it has a very elaborate lemon twist that's very very long and it spirals into the drink which is what gives it its name it's so long that it's long as a horse's neck perfect all right i'm gonna start there then that's a good (laughs) that's a perfect (laughs) place to start with that's one thing you and i have in common is because my favorite noir is also in a lonely place i absolutely love that movie what what is it that makes that your favorite out of all the the noirs that you've shown and discussed and seen over the years um, partly it's because it's about a writer. So I kind of identify with the writer character, which I probably shouldn't say because he's not a particularly nice man, <laughs> but, I, but I, I just found it fascinating. And I love that movie because I saw it when I was a teenager and I, it was over my head. Right. I mean, it, it's a very, very adult movie. So it was really about things that I had not yet experienced in my life. And but I knew there was something really great about it. And I loved Bogart's portrayal. Of course, I loved Gloria Graham. Mm -hmm. The whole the whole vibe of the film was was enticing to the young me. Yeah. And then I would watch this film every two or three years and it has steadily grown with me or I have grown with the film to where it's always speaking to me in some fresh way where whenever I revisit the movie Mm. and, and to me that that's very, very special because so many times you'll watch a movie, especially when you're young, you'll watch a film and you'll think it's the greatest movie ever made. And then you'll watch it 10 or 15 years later and you're kind of, Oh God, what was I thinking? You know, I mean, that's really not as good as I remember in a lonely place just continues to get better every time I watch it there, I find more stuff in there and it's, it's a deep movie. It's not a super complex movie, but it's a very deep movie in the way it it gets into human relationships and emotions and things. And, and, and I also appreciated the fact that for a movie made in 1950, it was incredibly adult in that, in that it did not, it has all the trappings of a crime melodrama, but it doesn't go there. It, it becomes something very different, which right. is why I think a lot of people sometimes like give me that fish eye when I say, you know, In a Lonely Place is my favorite movie. And they go, but that's not even a noir, is it? <laughs> and, <Of course> it <laughs> well, yeah, of course it is, because if you want to talk about, you know, one of the themes of noir being that people carry the seeds of their own destruction around with them you can certainly say that about the bogart character in that yes yes um so there that was a long answer to to that question but uh i'm glad i gave it to you (laughs) yeah no not at all a perfect answer and i I totally agree because it offers so much more with each viewing like any great piece of art uh does The, the people who feel the noir needs to always have a femme fatale and always have a, a doom protagonist. I was curious, do, do people uh, write to you and criticize your picks ever about what you show on TCM as a noir? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, not so much criticize. I, I appreciate the fact that a lot of people who watch Noir Alley 
um, they obviously feel a connection. And so I appreciate it if they, even if they take the time to like correct me on something or try to correct me on something, <laughs> um, I, I, am, I appreciate that level of engagement, you know, that people feel that they can do that. So, I, I mean, I get constructive criticism once in a while, but mostly it's like, I can't believe you didn't mention so-and-so who's in the film. And of course, you know, if I mentioned every single person who appears in the film that people recognize, my forever. intros are going to be <laughs> as long as the movie, right? Right. Um, so like recently, there was a very funny thing that happened, Robert. Uh, I did three weeks in a row in which I did not mention that there was a actor in the film who was a regular on Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> the oh. TV series Leave it to Beaver. So one week, the first week I showed it, I didn't mention that Barbara Billingsley was in the movie, right? Mrs. Right. Cleaver. Right. Then the next week I showed a movie and didn't mention that Hugh Beaumont, Mr. Cleaver, was in the movie. And then on the third week, I actually at this point had people writing to me saying, is there going to be another Leave it to Beaver actor in the next movie? And I'm <laughs> and I was like, I didn't even know I had done that. Right. It right. was just totally a coincidence. Right. And so I said, I have no idea. And I'll be darned. Larry Mondello, <laughs> the character Larry Mondello shows up in the in the third week's movie. Oh, wow. And people people. This is how conspiracy theories start, Robert. People were convinced that I was doing this intentionally. And then like you're playing <laughs> with us by not saying that they're in the movie. And it's like I had no idea. I had absolutely That's no funny. idea. <laughs> oh wow. I well I love this one of the one of the things you said about your father and for anyone who doesn't know, I'm sure if you follow Eddie you'll know that his father was a a sports white writer and one thing that I, I really enjoyed was that when people were arguing about boxing st boxing statistics who won this fight or whatever they would call your father up to get the final word and I have a similar experience with you because when I do a lot of film noir reviews and I post them on the Facebook groups and I always get people saying sweet, sweet smell of success is not a noir. Sunset Boulevard is not a noir. And then I just paste the link of your intros and say, <laughs> there's the final word. <laughs> and it doesn't work. People are, who cares what it is? <laughs> well, of course, which, which in actuality is very true, except that if you're going to say it's not, you better make a good you gotta, case. You got to back it up. Yeah. Exactly. You got to back it up. Right. I mean, yeah. because I've always said, Robert, that one of the things that makes that keeps noir um, alive and, and keeps it such a lively thing. I mean, nobody film fans in 2023 aren't arguing about which films are Westerns or which films are musicals. Right. But they right. love to argue whether something is noir or not. Right. Right. And, right. and that's the gift that keeps on giving because as long as you don't take it too seriously, because point, yeah. why would you, you know, you you can actually have interesting discussions about it. You know, yes. it, it, there's just that right amount of elasticity in the definition of noir that allows you to include things like sweet smell of success. And people would say there's no femme fatale. There's no murder. It is people behaving at their absolute worst, worst. Yes. in the yes. in the big city and abusing their power and trying to crush each other legitimately yes it's so very there, dark. there is a it is a very very dark film and uh you know and no film is better at showing like the neon jungle right and you know that's that's a very noir thing so yeah i have no hesitation uh calling that one a film noir no oh, me too me too what what is it about film noir that you love so much that has brought you to dedicate so much of your career too uh it's really because i mean it's uh, i love the fact that you that people like you or, or myself we love these movies so much but it's incredible to then go from love to books to the czar of noir so what is it that has has is there something that i know that might be difficult to answer but <laughs> uh it, it, not really uh like everyone else it's no different than everyone else i think everyone would say they're attracted to the style it's the style, both in front of the camera and the techniques, you know, the, the, the beautiful visuals, 
the fabulous mid 20th century style that's on display in these movies. But then once you get past the style, there's an incredible amount of substance. And then there is a, I have to say, I mean, there is a, an ethos, if you will, about noir that appeals to me. Um, it's, it, I find it very bracing. You know, the idea that you do know that left to our own devices, things aren't going to turn out very well. Mm. <laughs> and right. so these these are stories, you know, it's sort of the anti-myth. I called it that a long time ago. It's the Hollywood anti-myth where the original idea that Hollywood sold was, don't worry, everything's going to turn out OK and you'll live happily ever after. And noir completely turns that on its head and says, you better wake up because things are not what they seem and they're not going to turn out well unless you really make an effort. Mm -hmm. So, so that's how I separate, you know, my love of the movies from, you know, real people say, well, aren't you a pessimist or a fatalist? Or I say, no, because I don't actually live in the movies. I actually <laughs> can control my life, you know, right. and right. maybe I learned that from the movies. Don't make these mistakes. That that, exactly. that was the cautionary tale that everybody was telling, right? right? Don't do this. Right. That's very well said. That's a, some great points there for sure. Um, I one thing I read was that Robert Osborne passed away on the day you debut you were gonna debut on, on TCM. I was curious what on was the going day I did debut yeah, on TCM, on, yeah. On the day you debuted, and I was I was just curious what what was going through your mind when that's when you're starting? How did, how did that make you feel? Uh, terrible. Uh, I, I knew Bob uh, and, and I had actually done stuff on the air with him, both I'd done live shows and stuff on the air on TCM with Bob. And then eventually I, I did the summer of darkness in 2015 on TCM uh, hosted that. And I, I, you know, I, I loved Bob. He was a great guy and, and very much a mentor to me, All, although we, we weren't close or anything, but I knew that he approved <laughs> of me. <laughs> and um, so the day that Noir Alley debuted on TCM, March 5th, 2017, um, I got a phone call and I, it was from Sean Cameron, who was one of the directors at TCM. And I thought he was calling to congratulate me, you know, good congratulations on the show and stuff. And it was to tell me that Bob had just passed away and, uh, it, it was devastating. It was devastating mm -hmm. to everybody. There is no replacing Bob, you know, it takes, as I like to say, it takes five of us now to do Bob's job. Yeah. <laughs> he's certainly, he's certainly missed. He's just an incredible, incredible host. Um, I was, I was, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask also is that I know that in the late nineties, you, you started to devote your career to the projects that interested you. And well, I was just curious because I, I know that you were in the newspaper business for 16 years or so. And what gives what gave you the the confidence to just say, I'm just going to let that go and just go full on with my, you know, um, my own projects, mm -hmm. my own self-employed projects. My wife. Yeah. <laughs> my, oh, my wife is the answer to that question, because um, she our our kind of agreement was that she was in education. She was a teacher and she wanted to go into business for herself. She was tired of, frankly, it was the same story for both of us. We both got very tired of bureaucracy and not being the captain of your own ship, right? right. right. And so she wanted to go into business for herself. And so I said, okay, I was working uh, full time. I had the health benefits, the whole thing. Uh, and I said, I'm going to keep this job and you, I will support you while you get your business started and get your uh, sea legs. And she hit the deck running and was hugely successful and started her own sales company. And I mean, it was a complete 180 from what she was doing, right? And then once that was established, like five years in, uh, I said, okay, now it's my turn, you know? And I, I was very disheartened by 
what I saw in the corporate world where you'd, you'd try to get something going and every every time some other company would come in and buy out the company you right. work for and it was just it was that late 80s early 90s merger mania nonsense that unfortunately continues to this day and you know i just felt like i don't like this because in corporate america there's always the sense that the trap door can open at any time and the people who are above you they don't really care and they'll they'll just open the trap door and you'll fall in and all your plans are shot. So if you're the captain of your own ship, that can't happen to you. And so that's how my wife and I have sailed <laughs> for the last tw- 25 years or something. It's just like, you know, so when TCM came along and offered me this gig, I said, you know, yeah, OK, I'll do that because, uh, you know, it. It was good. It was good. Let's just put it that way. It's, it's a very good gig. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm sure it is. Uh, I I know your father was, like I mentioned earlier, was a newspaper man, a sports writer, like I said. Uh, do you think without his influence, I know he didn't directly say become a writer, Eddie, but without having him as, a, as your father with that upbringing, do you think you would have writing and becoming a writer and now the czar of noir would have happened? I know one can only speculate, but I, I, I have to think so, because I remember when I was very young, this is what I did. This is what I always did. I mean, I I, at one point I thought I was going to be a comic book writer and artist. But I when I was like five, I was making little books, illustrated books and stuff. And I was the kid who always turned in the the most stellar book report in school. You know, that was that was like my specialty. I loved putting stuff in books and presenting them and telling stories. So I do think that it was inevitable because I because when I was five or six years old, I didn't even know what my father did for a living, quite honestly. Right. And and I was already doing that kind of stuff. But then I realized, hey, if my dad can do this, my dad didn't even my dad didn't go to college. My dad barely graduated from high school. And yet here he was, he spent 50 years as a newspaper man, you know, working for William Randolph Hearst. So I knew it was, that was a way you could make a living. And, and um, so good, good question and interesting to think about. Um, I know that my dad was very, he never pushed me any which way, you know, and, uh, but I know that he was very, pleased whenever I would write something and he he'd make copies of it and take it and show it to his buddies right, right. and yeah. uh and that that was very gratifying has it been challenging at all to um get younger people interested in in noir um that's always going to be a challenge you can't focus on on the numbers Right. Because the vast majority of young people really don't care about old movies. So you have to focus on the ones who do. So it's been very interesting. I love being invited to speak to schools. Uh, I find that, you know, I've, I've done it. I've actually spoken to like girls clubs where the kids are like 10, 10 and 12. And I'm, oh, wow. I'm you know, and it's it's fascinating because that's that's when you have to get kids, but you know when they're that yeah. impressionable. Yes, at, at least express to them why watching old movies has value, right? And there's a way to do it. You kind of have to use humor, and you have to open their eyes to something that they they hadn't seen previously. And I know I've gone into high schools and colleges and things and i've shown you know the beginning of double indemnity the fabulous scene where fred mcmurray and barbara stanwick meet in her house and and i use that scene to explain to them how movies used to be made because i just say very simply what's happening in this scene and everybody gets it everybody gets it right and they and kids today will express it in the most basic terms imaginable, right? <laughs> uh, he wants to mm, her. And like, that's okay. Yeah, exactly. 
But here's why that's not obvious in this scene. And then I explain about the production code and how movies were made and how you had to use language in more creative ways and all this. And, and they totally get it, you know. And then I, I always end by saying, you know, so what I want you to take away today is your when I started doing this, Robert, I would say your grandparents were a lot cooler than you realized. And now I say your great grandparents were a lot cooler than you realized. <laughs> well, I because I, I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that the TCM noticed how how many young people were going to the noir festivals. And so so obviously you have a knack for getting people to, to see how great these movies are. <laughs> uh, I do. I do believe that was the case. I think uh, TCM sent some emissaries who are now dear friends uh, to my festivals. And I believe they said, wow, you know, this is a demographic that that we need. Um and and that's kind of how that all began. I, I've mm. I have always maintained that film noir is the gateway drug to classic cinema because I think young people will watch a noir film more avidly than they'll watch a western or a screwball comedy or something. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Certainly true of young men who will watch noir. Maybe they'll watch a western, but they're going to shy away. You know from the Philadelphia story or bringing up baby or the lady Eve or something like that. Young women get those films instantly. Um, but, you know, it's just, uh, there, there's, there was a lot of truth to that, that uh, the younger audience is, is uh, vital to what mm. we're doing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. One thing I wanted to ask you also was, you know, a lot of people say, 58 or 59 was the end of the classic noir period. And you mentioned something about Psycho having a lot to do with that. Uh, what what was it about Psycho that you think just brought the curtain down or the shower curtain across? Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Um, well, when I, when I wrote uh, Dark City, The Lost World of Film Noir at the end of the 1990s, um, I, I was coming to the end of that story and exactly as you say a lot of people saw 59 and odds against tomorrow is sort of the end of the or touch of evil wells's touch of evil was very convenient because in some ways he kind of created the look of noir and citizen kane kind right. of you could argue that right and then he drops the curtain with touch of evil where you can't get more baroque than the way he made that film yes but but I said, well, you know, it's interesting because the very next year, Psycho comes out. And when you really think about it, Psycho begins exactly like a film noir. It, it is a film noir. It's about a woman in a, in a love affair who decides the only way she can get out is to steal this money. And she goes on the run. It's totally noir. And then all of a sudden, everything changes. Everything, not just in the story, but in movie making changes when she takes that shower mm. and and it and to me it was a very symbolic way of saying okay that was the end of one era and the start of something else now i don't mean to suggest that film noir completely ended with the creation of psycho but uh you, you get where i'm coming from i yes. mean oh absolutely the the, the subtlety and the approach uh, of the storytelling approach that was used in classic noir films kind of went out the window with Psycho because mm -hmm. it, it, now it was a cinema of sensation started to come in and you would see how Psycho would influence another generation of filmmakers, you know, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's the be all and end all this observation, but it clearly uh, is a demarcation mm. point in American cinema. Well, it's an, it's it's a really interesting observation because I, I don't know how you'd feel I don't know how you feel about this, but what I've noticed about what is considered the neo noir, well, not even period, because it's just continued from fifty nine or sixty onwards, is they they often will combine genres, uh, like for example. Uh, King of New York is it touches noir, but it also touches on horror. 
uh, or something like Mulholland Drive that I know you mentioned is is surrealism meets horror, so Mm -hmm. So it seemed to um, touch on and explore other genres within the traditional classic noir or something like body heat where it's like okay well we Mm -hmm. don't have to worry about censorship so we could show what they couldn't show before and really explore the sexuality in the within the relationships uh was do you feel that the that's sort of how it's gone in a general sense uh absolutely uh and science fiction has adopted a lot of noir a lot of the stylistics of noir and you get things like blade runner and dark city and gattaca and uh, films like that that very much have a noir feel and then as you said there's there's horror hybrids uh it's very popular to take the detective story form and push it into other areas you know a film like angel heart you know for example oh, yes. which is yes. a you know is a supernatural movie masquerading as a detective story uh so yeah you see that i think mm quite a bit and of course you know back in the uh that earlier period we were talking about i mean you can really see the change when you go um with the killers the 1964 version of the killers as opposed to the 1946 version of the killers i mean how perfect is that you're just inverting it right from 46 to 64 and and they're the same story but they're told in entirely different ways yeah no, I, I, absolutely. What one thing I do for my Patreon members, I was inspired by your noir or not videos. So I do a neo noir or not, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that that's just going through all these movies that I put on the poll. I was like, you know, there's a lot of combining genres, but you could see how its influence has touched, you know, almost everything. Uh, that's right. that's um, which again is really fascinating to see how strong it's been. Um, it's it's interesting, Robert. Back in the in the original era, the thing that was very noticeable about the films is they alarmed people because um, they were suggesting that there was a lot of corruption in American culture that was not being addressed. And that, that was one of the things that film noir did. It suggested uh, a culpability and a corruption in the society that was unheard of in popular entertainment before the time. Now, how ironic is it that people watch these older films as like comfort food to remind them of a simpler time? (laughs) Because we're so incredibly cynical now. Mm. Just the expectation is, of course, these people are out for themselves. And of course, these people are going to do the wrong thing. I mean, I, I, I don't need to paint a picture of this but where we're at right now is exactly where a lot of these writers and filmmakers were suggesting we could end up right if we weren't careful well we're there right we're there yeah you're absolutely (laughs) i mean the world is film noir now (laughs) it's like exactly uh it's unbelievable uh as a aside from noir are what are some favorite non-noir movies of yours Oh, gosh, there's all kinds of them. Uh, you know, I was just talking to somebody about this last night. I, I should have my list here. But, you know, I was finally asked to contribute to the sight and sound poll of the 100 oh. greatest movies ever made. And it it would probably surprise people to realize I didn't put a lot of noir oh. on on my list. Right. I didn't even put in a lonely place on my list. Just just because as much as I love that movie, I I. And I think it's great. My criterion for a great film right. is is slightly different. So, right. you know, I included, I did include Sunset Boulevard on that list, which I yeah. just think is a absolutely great oh, film. Absolutely. And, um, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. I can't remember now what was on that list, but, you know, Renoir's The Rules of the Game oh, is on the masterpiece. list. And, masterpiece. and I'm, a, yeah. I'm old school. I still am not kicking citizen kane off my list of the right. 10 greatest movies ever made um anyway there there were a lot of films that, on that list that might surprise people yeah no I, I i only not that long ago saw the rules of the game for the first time because i was invited on a podcast to review it so i did like a 
Renoir crash course and what a genius and who also touched on noir occasionally as well. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> that, that disastrous film he made at RKO, the woman on the beach is such an interesting story. The story yes. of the making of that film is actually better than the film itself. Yeah. I was, I was reading a little bit about that. There was another one I only just recently saw and it, it, it feels like something got cut up. It just feels something. Oh, he right. was, he yeah. was making a movie that Hollywood was not prepared for. He was making right. something very poetic and artistic yes. and, and they just chopped the hell out of it. And uh, yeah, what's, what's left is an interesting mutilation. Yes. Uh, yes. It's, a, it's unfortunate. I mentioned, I, I mentioned it to his son, Shaney and for anyone watching now you'll you'll know i've had shaney on a few times and that's exactly what he said it just felt like they just cut this thing to shreds uh which is a shame because you're, you're talking about you're talking about robert ryan now. sorry robert ryan's yeah, son yeah. shaney yeah who i've had on my show a few times and but he met renoir uh as well so he had some interesting stories um i i just had one last question i was i was curious do you ever do you ever see any actors today who you just feel would would have been perfect in the classic film noir period? Does anyone stand out to you? Um, I'm trying to think. You know, it's funny, Robert. It's hard for me to answer this question because as I get older, time just compresses terribly. And so I'd give you the name of somebody and you'd say, that's interesting considering that they've been dead for 12 years, you know, or whatever. <laughs> so I, I always, I, cause the first person that popped to mind that I really loved watching because he just did crime stuff was Dennis Farina who oh, yeah. you know did crime yeah. story and was in get shorty and all right. and out he of sight and all this stuff. He was originally, he was, cop. he was a yeah. Chicago cop. And yeah. I just thought, man, he would have just been perfect back in the day, you know, as oh, Michael sure. Mann knew, which is why he turned him into an actor. Um, but that, that's a, that's a tricky one. How, how, do you have anybody? Do you, does anybody pop to mind immediately? Not, not so, not so much the men, uh, but more of some of the women, like someone like January Jones, I think would have like, who, of course, the mad Men, mm -hmm. it's easy to pair her with because of that, 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 that not that that's noir, but it's the 60s. So it gives you the feel for, but she has a certain ice cold quality, uh, hmm. that I think would have been uh, perfect, but I can't think of, of two. Well, I'll tell you one myself. that I'll tell you one that I saw recently who was to in a film that was terrific. And she's really great is Aubrey Plaza oh, who yes, did uh, yes, this I, film, yeah. Emily, the criminal yeah, she's and great. Emily, the criminal to me is like, you know, I, I don't want to oversell it by calling it a landmark film, but it, it's a film that is perfectly representative of noir for this moment. Oh, I'll that, check that, that out. movie, that movie is, is it uh, because it's, you know, a female protagonist. It's about the economic uh, crush in this country right now. For a lot of people, it's about a woman who can't repay her student loan debt oh. uh, and turns to crime. Oh, it's like, perfect. this, this is like, that's neo noir it, now. It, it, it nails <laughs> yeah. it, you know, yeah. and the, the the crimes are not, you know, crimes of passion. It's it's you know credit card fraud mm. and stuff like that. And it's it's like this is so right on for being a modern day noir. And she's she's terrific. Oh, uh, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to see that. Yeah, I can see her in that that period certainly. Um, well, this has been such a great chat, Eddie. I really appreciate your time, and I highly, highly recommend the book. I, I only read a digital copy, but I have a hard, a physical copy coming. And the photos, there we go. The photos are incredible. The design team, I know you collaborated closely with the design team. They did an outstanding job. That's something you I, I agree. put on your shelf. That's a book I agree. on your shelf. <laughs> yeah, and I tell people, don't be, uh, I, I tell people who say it's so beautiful, I don't want to uh, wreck it by getting it stained with the, you know, and I say, Oh no, 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 no. Just buy two, right. uh, you know, <laughs> one to put on the shelf and preserve and one to use when you're making the cocktails. Yeah. So spill, spill gin and scotch all over it. It's, it's good for it. There you go. That's a great idea. Well, again, I highly recommend getting the book and I want to thank Eddie again. Where, where can people 
follow you? Are you are you a big social? I know you're on Twitter, but are you a big <laughs> social media person? <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm not really a huge social media person. I don't I don't like the tenor of the discourse on social media. Uh, but I do, but I do go on, you know, to promote Noir Alley and to promote the books and stuff like that and let people know what I'm doing and where and when. Um, so, you know, and I have my website, eddiemuller.com. Uh, and of course, I always encourage people to check out what's going on with the Film Noir Foundation. Yes. Uh, which rescues and restores, you know, at risk movies. And that's filmnoirfoundation.org. And, and we're always doing our film noir festivals. So if you want to see these movies, you know, watch Noir Alley, please. Uh, but if you want to see these movies on the big screen, as they were supposed to be seen, yes. uh, check out one of our film festivals. We just finished one in Boston. I'm going to be in Philadelphia in July. I think the 21st to the 23rd of July, um, showing a lot of these pictures live and doing a book signing for Noir Bar. We'll be making cocktails from the book uh so it'll be a lot of fun fantastic and you have another book coming out in the fall right uh children oh have me back and i'll talk about yes. that one have me yes. back it yeah, is a I'll children's book what, what what we were talking about earlier about having to get kids when they're impressionable this is a children's book called kid noir uh you know for ages four to eight and, oh, and uh you know my my goal here is to it's in black and white obviously and then my goal is to get kids familiarized with this, the noir look and the iconography of it so that when they watch a movie, it won't seem weird to them. It'll just be like their book, which right. I hope will be one of their favorites. Oh, I'm sure it will be. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And and thanks again, Eddie. And thanks so much for all the work you do. You've introduced me to so many great films. So I have to, I owe that to you, <laughs> certainly. So I appreciate I look, that very much, Robert. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. That means a lot. My pleasure. So I look forward to having you back again sometime. I'd love to. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link, patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. You can also leave a donation directly to my YouTube channel by pressing the thanks link, which you will find directly below the video frame beside the like comment links. Just click the thanks link. And from there, you can leave a donation if you choose to. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please, consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. It is absolutely free to do so. By pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the Movies logo, you will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left. In just a second, just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.